Globus. Okay, Ohayo gozaimasu, good morning. So, Reiwanomics, what on earth is that, <laughs> right? But I thought, you know, we're past Abenomics. And actually, I don't care whether you like Abe or do not like Abe. They do provide stability, right? They are consistent. They don't do anything weird. And they are pro-business. There's no question that the Abe administration is very much pro-business, right? And so we can talk about the unstable world. We can complain about Mr. Trump. But we are business people. We are leaders. We are investors. We need to get on with things. And so what I wanted to do with this panel is sort of highlight and engage with the audience, right? What can you do? What can your company do to actually make Japan more sustainable, to achieve greater prosperity, to overcome and take on some of the challenges that are going on? And I think we've got a fantastic panel here. And Peter, I'm going to put you on the spotlight here. If you could sort of over the next sort of two or three minutes, give us a little bit of highlights what you, what your company, which is a monster, right? It's one of the gigantic companies in the world, right? What are you doing to make Japan a better place? I think AI is obviously a huge opportunity because there's an openness to it in this country that you don't see elsewhere in terms of uh, the drive to automation, the use of uh, breakthrough technologies like machine learning. So one of my favorite stories is um, uh, Makoto, who lives in the Kosai area. He was working, uh, and then he left his job to go to cucumber farming uh, because that's what his family did. And using TensorFlow, which is um, an SDK you can get, he helped his family sort cucumbers using AI because they'd spend all their time just trying to find the right size and shape because if you're going to a sushi restaurant or to a grocery, it really depends the amount market value you get. So that's an example of using machine learning uh, to uh, radically improve uh, you know, just how well they're doing that sorting as a family. So with AI, we announced something in July, uh, Google AI for Japan. How do you train the next generation on AI talent? How do you uh, create research? So there are six research grants. Uh, working with uh, uh, Tokyo University, Kyoto, um, Tohoku. So we feel that that's going to be a real breakthrough opportunity for Japan. Because if uh, similar to, you could say, how uh, maybe China leapfrogged with digital payments, uh, Japan could do that uh, with AI to drive productivity, to drive innovation. So very excited on that uh, topic. Fantastic. Now, that's the private sector, right? And we come back to that. Now we've got the public sector. I mean, here's a young, handsome politician, <laughs> right? The governor of uh, Okayama Prefecture, yeah. right? Um, what are you doing to make Japan a better place? Oh, yes. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, access, uh, center, uh, concentration of population and large cooperation to Tokyo. Um, I'll make it quick, but many Japanese people, especially well-educated people, are focused, uh, forced to choose between two options. One, uh, live in Tokyo, work for a good company, and live a miserable life. Um, you know, small house, high rent, and long commute, and golf courses, and uh, campsites mi millions of miles away. Uh, and the other option is to live in a smaller city. Um, yeah, commuting time is short, house is larger, but the problem is um, it should be hard to find a good job, um, a job you deserve. So, um, well, the, the, you, you know the problem, more than 60% of the big uh, listed companies have headquarters in Tokyo area. And if you talk about the um, biggest companies in Japan, I would say all companies except for Toyota are in Tokyo. So um, no, this dilemma makes the standard of living in Japan much worse than its potential. So um, uh, we have to do something about it. Um, and Japanese government has uh, taken various measures to cope with this uh, problem um, for, for years without making meaningful changes. So we have to do something 
yeah, yeah in Rewa. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, right. I, I'll stop here. Yeah. Right. Fantastic. I think. I mean. We've, we've got something here that's very concrete, because there's obviously a lot of talk about technology, and yes, yes, technology can make our lives better, right? And then we've got a Japan-specific issue, which is this massive urbanization, while the countryside is, sorry, dying, right? Um, and actually connecting the two together, like we saw with the example from the cucumber farmer, right? I mean, using AI to actually improve the yield, to improve the business, right, and revitalize the region. I assume that his cucumber farm was not in Nagoya, right? <laughs> Koisei City. Okay, I have no idea where that is. <laughs> right? No, that's fine, right? You know, and here, you know, sort of on, at the political level, right, again, trying to address that sort of issue. Now, Tomoe. You live and breathe uh, Silicon Valley, yep. and you spend a lot of time here uh, in Japan. Mm -hmm. Talk us, tell us a little bit about you know your story, and you know where you've seen some success, and where you see some of the challenges. Yes. So uh, just to build on to what Peter said, my company Palo Alto Insight is based in Silicon Valley. So we have a team of engineers in Seattle and Silicon Valley. But then our mission is to help Japanese companies innovate through AI technologies. So we work with a lot of local Japanese companies, big and small, small meaning the smallest we can work with is like five people, five employees. You can make big impact doing AI. And then the big companies we work with could be 10,000 employees or even bigger. But um, our focus is more on the SMBs, small to mid-sized businesses in Japan. Because if you think about the business in Japan, 99.7% of companies in Japan are SMBs. So the definition of SMBs can vary depending on the industry, but we do have a lot of SMBs. And the issue that we have is that SMBs don't have engineers. They don't have access to the talent that Google has. And so just to give you some numbers, 90% of software engineers and data scientists in Japan work for IT companies, including system integrators, IT vendors, and the big IT companies. And whereas in the US, it's actually the opposite. 90 or 70% of the engineers work at non-IT companies. So let's say if you are, you know, if you are the CEO of a company in retail, where you have 50 employees, and you want to do something with AI to increase customer satisfaction or to increase average revenue per user, you have no access whatsoever to what kind of AI can they use because you have nobody to talk to. That is the real issue that we have to tackle into. And TensorFlow is amazing. We use TensorFlow every day, almost like you know, in every project we use TensorFlow. But then we have to build a gap between this amazing technology, free, accessible, but then Japanese companies, a lot of, let's say 90%, they don't know that it's there, it's available. They don't know how to use. So that's why my company, Palo Alto Insight, is there to bridge the gap between what's available, what's latest for, from Silicon Valley, to who needs them the most. Tomoe, I'm going to cut in here. And yeah. the, the one question now, so you are the cultural bridge, right? Kind of, yes. um, For 30 seconds, right? What do you see, what's, what's the biggest difference between dealing with a small, medium-sized company in the US compared to dealing with a small and medium-sized company in Japan? Well, so the biggest difference is that how they look at AI in terms of company strategy. So if I talk to CEO at SMBs in Japan, they see AI investment as cost center. They want to see the direct tangible result in one quarter or two quarters. So, okay, let's say you introduce optimization AI in the logistics company and you save 20% of one person's time. How much money can you save? That's the very narrow-sided thinking of using AI. Whereas in the US, well, I can't really generalize, but then the right question to ask is what kind of other potential impact can you make by introducing or by implementing some AI technology? Not just thinking about short-term direct PL impact, because if you just think about small impact, it's not gonna happen. So that is the biggest problem. And the, the, the real understanding of true machine learning is lacking. 
I mean, this, this to me is very, very interesting, right? Because again, you know, Japanese companies are unbelievably proud, right? The Shanai Bunka of Mitsubishi, the Shanai Bunka, the internal culture of Hitachi, it's our way, we will never change. We will treat new technology <laughs> as a cost center rather than as, yes, yes, transformative. I'm gonna tell you a funny yeah. story. I was on the stage with Yanai-san, who is a brilliant, obviously superbly brilliant business leader. And he's got this Ariake project, you know, where they build the new headquarters out back by the Rainbow Bridge and everything is gonna be changing. And so I said, well, that's cool. So now you've got an open cafeteria and it looks like a Starbucks. That's all very nice and well. Uh, are you going to change the Ringi system? No, of course not. Well, I mean, okay, it's kind of, if you don't change... Can I tell you one story? So, um, so the new ministry, uh, IT ministry, um, he said um, he wants to digitize everything while keeping the Hanko CEO, personal CEO culture. And um, no offense, right? Hanko is great. But then um, you have to... <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so you have to think about what what does it really mean to do innovation? It means you have to disrupt, you have to make change, you have to break the old status quo. You have to question, is it worth it? So, but then that, that's, that's something so, it's lacking. So I think you're getting why we call this Reiwanomics. Because this is not something that Prime Minister Abe or Hataraki Katakaikaku, that some top-down rule change is gonna change. It depends on your mindset, your manager's mindset, right, to actually change, you know, and thereby, you know, adopting technology, change the way of doing business, right, and thereby you're going to start to actually help boost productivity. Now, Joanna, your insights. Um. I've been working with some very small companies in Japan, um, SMEs. These are not IT companies. These are small companies typically set up by an individual inventor, entrepreneur. He's come up with a good idea, developed a technology, tested it. It works. He, set up, he sets up a small company, tries to fight his way into the marketplace, and hits a wall. The acceptance of SMEs in Japan is definitely not what it should be. Um, and I've been working with this little organization set up by a former METI vice minister to help these small companies get access to funding, the right contacts. It's very, very hard work. For an example, there's a company called, um, that produces a, a, an insulating paint called Gaina, which is, he's been running the company for 20 years and finally he's broken through because he won an award and he has got funding finally from MUFG Bank. Uh, but it's been a struggle. Another example is a, a man who, who discovered a naturally occurring bacteria that, that um, will dissolve organic waste. So in Tokyo, there are something like 20 massive waste incineration plants, which use a lot of energy and very, I mean, environmental emissions are emitted, so they need more power to get rid of them. And in his city, Kagoshima, for 20 years, they've used zero incineration plants, and they use this bacteria. Maybe Okayama could adopt this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he has had problems getting it out there. India is now adopting it to get rid of the legacy waste mountains in big cities. And now, finally, he's getting recognition. But there is a sort of societal distrust of small companies, and this needs to change. Okay, so we've got IT as the opportunity, right? We've got local leaders who are spearheading greater decentralization and improving the quality of life, right? Of, you know, the Japanese people, right? We've got, um, you know, entrepreneurs bringing in, right? Better business practices, right? Um, and, you know, we've got former METI vice ministers not accepting cushy jobs in some board, but actually helping, you know, small and medium-sized companies, you know, sort of coming through here. Now, I want to pick up, and I want to focus again on you, Peter, um, you know, education, 
right? Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you know, there was remember this conference that uh, that you guys hosted, um, and uh, you know, I learned this this fascinating fact. You know, machine learning. Anybody here know what machine learning is? I, I don't. We kind of it sounds really good, right? It's, it's, it's a, the bright future is machine learning. Now, machine learning, um, you know, apparently Google uh, employs more machine learning engineers than all of Japan. Um, the point I'm trying to make is education, right? Now, again, education. We need to retrain young workers, fine, but also old workers, right? We need to learn. I mean, even I need to learn how to use an iPhone on Snapchat, right? No, but in all seriousness, education often said, what are you doing about it? So we pledge to train 10 million people in Japan by 2022 on digital skills. So that's machine learning crash course. We just had 600 developers in Japan learning how to use things like TensorFlow. We have something called Cloud Auto ML, uh, which a company called, called QP used uh, to, you know, train the system, feeding it a lot of images of good potatoes and blemished potatoes. So instead of 60 people on a factory floor just sifting through and finding the bad potato, you have an automated system with uh, machine vision that can do that. And the other, the 60 people in each of those factories can then get on and do much more value added work. Uh, so have lots of examples of that from uh, small businesses to large businesses doing this. And I think, um, you know, clearly K to 12, uh, we're partnering with uh, Mino No Code. And so two million, over 2 million will have uh, training in uh, coding at that age. So what, what I hope happens is uh, from SMBs, to students at undergraduate or graduate level uh, will get exposed to things like machine learning because even if you're not going to computer science, this is very valuable uh, to understand how it can be uh, transformational in terms of productivity, uh, how you can really drive uh, innovation. And I think what I'm proud of is that with things like TensorFlow, it's been downloaded over 41 million times. So we're trying to open... Here in Japan. Uh, this is around the world uh, to be able to allow... Uh, people that don't have this background in training uh, to be able to use it. And so uh, the digital skills gap is very significant here. Uh, we've looked at um, some studies that by 2030, there'd be a gap of 6 million jobs uh, here in Japan. So that's why uh, it's really urgent and important that we all work together uh, to provide this type of training from large companies to small. Uh, Peter, if I, if I may follow up the, at the next level. What is the pushback that you're getting? Who is cooperative? Are the universities cooperatives? Are you starting at the high school level? Are the companies giving you pushback? You know, what's, because it seems, you know, fine, so it's Google doing it, but it seems like an obvious thing, you know, that we need to, or that, that workers need to upgrade their skill here. What are, what are, what are, some, what are some of the, the obstacles that you run into? Yes, I think, I mean, so, sometimes you're just like in, 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 let's say, the schools like K to 12, how do you introduce technology if it's not really there today? How do you do it in a very kind of healthy uh, manner? Uh, because some schools, for example, international, they already have computers in the classroom. So it's easy, for example, for um, a teacher to lead um, a class on coding because it's already there, uh, it's fun, uh, the kids can engage, and um, so, so again, if you don't have that technology in the classroom, it's hard to deploy something that you could you know, potentially get out to, to millions uh, of, of students. So that's one of probably the biggest challenges that I see. I think the, uh, the openness to it from large companies, when we meet with the top CEOs of these companies, sometimes they have over 200,000 people in their employ, and they know this is one of the biggest and most important things for their young generation, because if they can get their young generation embracing these tools, these platforms, that can really transform the company. I think the SMBs, the biggest challenge that I've seen is time. They're just doing everything possible to keep things running. So, you know, how do you introduce just a bit of skills so you show up in maps or you have a website? You know, for the Olympics coming up, it's so important that these companies can be discovered. Uh, and longer term, with inbound tourism, that's going to be a core skill. So how do you get all SMBs to embrace this as a way to survive and thrive? Governor, any comment on that? I didn't know that Google uh, was doing such great things, even though I have a classmate from Stanford um, working for Google. Um, I have, and I didn't know that uh, Miyazaki, uh, 
Oh, no, no, no. Kagoshima, Kagoshima is doing such a wonderful thing. I, I have to work harder uh, to know, you know, you know, who is doing you know, what. But, but yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm so glad to be here uh, to know. Um, yeah. well, I mean, you know, we expect and, and, you ne next year to report back on the great success. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. And, I, and I'm a real animal. Uh, I'm, I have an engineering degree, and I have uh, an experience to run my family business, and I, I am um, my MBA. Um, typical governor in Japan uh, has low degree uh, from the University of Tokyo, and then work for the government, uh, typically jitsho, uh, somusho, and then become vice governor and become you know governor. So um, you know, I, I think I have to introduce more you know kind of diversity. I have to bring in new ideas and you know, show that. Uh, local government can do much more than we are currently doing, and yeah. I, I'm going to put you on the spot. How mm -hmm. long have you been governor? Um, this is my seventh year. Your seventh yeah. year. What's your greatest success? My greatest success will be reducing the criminal rate in, in my hometown. In Okayama? Yeah, Okayama, uh, uh, it's a shame, but Okayama used to be the criminal city seven years ago, uh, the worst in Japan, and now the criminal rate is um, less than half of the, the level. So, uh, so how, how, how did you do that? Uh, I introduced police to schools. It's, it's, it's very rare in Japan. Um, Introduce police, police to school. To school. And the, the criminal rate for uh, juniors uh, went down to uh, one fourth right ah. now. So, um, and, and then, well, uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't sound like blah, blah, blah. Uh, 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 yeah. The, the, the cri uh, attack criminal things, and then um, the, the kind of um, remaking education because our education level was quite low. Um, the only Okinawa and coach was behind us. And so um, e even though Okayama was once told the best education state, so um, it's catching up. So um, the, my uh, industry revitalization and rebuilding education was my two promises uh, seven years ago. So and so seven years in, what is your biggest frustration? Frustration. Well, um, for me, central government is the kind of um, blockage. Yeah, uh, the the Hanko problem. Yeah, I yeah I really wanted to. Um, Reduce, no, not not reduce, but uh, yeah, s stop using hankos. But but the, always central government requires that. So um, uh, yeah, I, I love the way. We, so we've 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 we're going to fix Japan's problem very easy. Just get rid of the hanko, everything's fine. <laughs> right? That <it> seems <laughs> to be the, that. the conclusion so far. Right? No, but so the so the central government right control that you have. Right. So. Um, I became governor because I, I thought governor is kind of a president of Okayama Prefecture. Uh, but really, the Okayama Prefecture is something like a subsidiary of Japanese government. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the power is quite limited. Well, uh, it's much smaller than I imagined. So. Kind of, that, that's the sort of my frustration. But again, it is interesting, right? Because, I mean, fine. So, you know, Japan is top down, right? Kasumigaseki rules, right? And you run into frustrations. But you can get things done. You yeah. can overcome some of the some challenges. Extent, yeah. You know, and obviously, again, tackling, I mean, this is, this is sort of the very basic level of education, right? If half of the high school students become Yakuza, sorry, um, <laughs> not, not th th that's, that's going to be a waste on, <laughs> not half, no, two thirds? No. <laughs> Shitsuri shimashita. <laughs> Love Okayama, right? No, but, but you know, but, but for, so this is a very, very basic level, right? Um, you know, now then, you know, reducing the crime rate, right? Um, you know, revitalizing entrepreneurship, right? Um, that's sort of a, a, a way forward. Now, in your dealings with Japan, right, what has been your biggest success story? So, uh, speaking of the government, it's good and bad. So, the good thing is uh, we work with the 
Japanese government. Last year, we got a government funding and uh, to work with a company actually based in Okayama. They are headquarters in Kyoto, but then they have a big factory in Okayama. And they are manufacturer. They are making chip and circuit boards. And they have about 50 employees. Um, yes. So what we did was uh, we sent uh, American data scientists and engineers to the factory in Bizen, mm -hmm. and then we look at the entire operation flow, making sure where, how can we improve the the process, and we decided that we need AI uh, in the last process of the manufacturing, which is QA, quality assurance. So people actually spend six seconds every chip making sure it doesn't have any anything bad because if it has any any defect they have to send it to they, they can't really ship it and then we introduced the machine learning to make sure that it's it's kind of semi automated process and it's a japanese small company in okayama so first they thought oh we need big data right and then i said that's not true. We all we need is let's say you collect 200 images of the chip, you know, good and bad, and it's not that hard. Think about it. It's just taking pictures of 200 images, and then we sort of increase the number of images, and then we build the model. So I think the biggest success for us is to help local Japanese companies understand that you don't have to have big data to start using AI. And all you have to do is understand where the big issue is. So it's always start with why, not start with how, because how is about methodologies, but why is about finding the purpose, like finding the issue. So that, that is one of the, our, our biggest success. And um, going back to the education, um, I, I want to tell you a very interesting story that um, from our client that we work with. So this is another project. Uh, it's a big Japanese company, and they have a group of uh, entrepreneurs. It's entrepreneurs inside the company. And they are doing something very different from their existing businesses. And uh, my uh, point of contact is somebody who is like in his 50s who has no experience in computer science. but by working with us, this person started to work, you know, started to learn Python on his own using MOOC. So that is, and then now he's becoming a new data scientist at the company. And that is the biggest side effect or ripple effect that we create right. by doing the small AI project. Right. You know, I think it's so true that we need to help these entrepreneurs um, uh, to be successful, not just in Japan, but elsewhere. Uh, one thing that we announced recently was a program, we call it Launchpad Accelerator, but we took seven Japanese kind of high growth potential startups and worked with them. We went to you know California together, to Silicon Valley, went to Tel Aviv, just trying to get these great companies and entrepreneurs connected in with the rest of the world, but also just make a lot of the tools uh, and platforms more accessible. So we're going to open a physical campus in a new office we're opening in Shibuya in November, where startups can work out of for free, uh, cafes, there'll be events every day, uh, and we'll have a residency program as well, because we really feel the last six years, there's been momentum. Uh, investment has increased by six times. Uh, you have about 50 next unicorns, so valued at over 100 million. So it's a really important moment for Japan, I think, over the next decade or two to start creating these unicorns that can create the jobs, that can drive the innovation, uh, that can really make a difference, not just in Japan, but elsewhere. And this is, now we're on, on my favorite topic, right? Which is entrepreneurship. And as, as you know, I'm a macro guy. Right? Um, and so, you know, it's not monetary policy. It's not fiscal policy that impacts the long-term growth rate of an economy. By the way, it's not demographics. The demographic thing is a complete myth, right? The one thing that has a high correlation and positive uh, causality is entrepreneurship. If you grow the number of entrepreneurs in your population, by 1%, your potential growth rate goes up by 0.5 to 0.6%. This is true in Nigeria. This is true in China. This is true in the United States. This is true across the board. And so whatever you can do to actually raise entrepreneurship, to create that ecosystem, right, 
Because what's the thing with entrepreneurs? What's the terrible thing? You're a big entrepreneur. What's the terrible thing? How often did you fail? You crash and burn, right? Yeah, you crash and burn. You crash and burn, right? To have that ecosystem, right? To actually allow failure, to learn from failure, right? That's where it comes through. And the second thing, of course, was mentioned here, intrapreneurship, right? So it's very interesting. Now, thank you, Toshiba, Hitachi, Omron, these companies finally are setting up divisions for intrapreneurship. I'm going to run a venture capital fund inside the company. So Tanya-san and myself, we go visit these companies, right? And you sort of talk, and they're all very bright, and they've got the right idea, this, that, or the other. And then you ask, ja, how big's your budget? Oh, $30 million. You go, excuse me? You're a multi-hundred billion dollar company, and your venture capital fund is $30 million. That, that, I mean, $30 million, that means the average amount invested per deal is about $250,000, $300,000. I mean, that, that, the dog of the Silicon Valley guys invests more than that. I mean, sorry, what I'm trying to say is, again... And, we, and Jesper, just one stat that completely confirms what you're saying is if you look at what's invested in startups in Japan as a percentage of GDP, Right, the difference is radical. It's 0.05%. If you look at China, US, it's 0.4. So right there, you can see the 8x difference. So in the next four or five years, we could see, an, you know, you could see this investment total amount three times. Yeah. It, but, and, and, and the interesting thing is, again, if you, it's not to be critical, right, but to be constructive, right? Japanese companies have 500 trillion yen worth of cash on their balance sheet. It's sitting there earning nothing, right? Now, being a bit more daring, taking more risk, right, by supporting, right, venture activity, by supporting angel investment, you know, that certainly, I think, is, is a very, very big thing. Now, Joanna, you know, England is very, very good um, in entrepreneurship. It's very bad at other things, right? <laughs> But that's okay, maybe they're going to redeem themselves. You'll have Brexit and chaos, but you win the Rugby World Cup. <laughs> but tell us a little bit about your experience sort of with, with, with uh, you know, sort of entrepreneurship, with small and medium-sized companies. I mean, how do, you, how do you get out? What can Japan learn from England? I think it's in education, start young, get the schools to talk about it, get entrepreneurs to come and give talks in schools. All my children have been lucky enough to have talks from Richard Branson, really interesting people who fire them up, show them that it's a good idea to stick your head above the parapet and go against the crowd. They enter competitions, they're invited to invent things, to build little businesses aged 14. You know, there's a lot of talk about ideas, inventions, entrepreneurial activities, and the value that that can bring later on in life. You know, how many young kids meeting someone like Richard Branson won't think, oh, I've got to think of something clever and I'll get as rich as him. You know, it, I think it needs to start young. And the other aspect is to have a population that is accepting of new small companies. I think in Japan, one of the biggest blocks is this thing that, oh, I should go and work for a big company. My parents supported me all the way through my education, and they want me to go and work for Mitsubishi, so I better do that. It takes guts to go against that. And I just think it needs to be instilled very early on, this idea that you have much greater value if you go and do something different. You know, it's, it's, it's very funny. So I you know, travel the world, basically I'm, I'm one week out of four, I'm talking to global hedge funds, to sovereign wealth funds, yada da, always selling Japan, right? I'm, I'm a good salesman, right? <laughs> no, but, no, but, you know, but, you know one, of, one of the pushbacks is like, is the following. Japan now has the world's largest technology venture capital fund, right? It's the SoftBank Vision Fund. Right, which is the big, I mean, that is bigger than Google in the venture capital space, right? But that vision fund hasn't made a single investment in a Japanese company. So global investors like sovereign wealth funds say, well, if, if, if the most aggressive venture capitalist in the world does not invest in Japan, why the hell should I invest in Japan? I mean, it's quite, it's quite interesting, right? And again, there's, there's lots of 
you know, lots of things wrong. I think we're moving in the right direction, but I think what you, as leaders of your corporations, you know, you as, you know, people who are, what is that called? Influencers, right? In your respective industries, right? Creating that ec ecosystem, right? I think is one of the big challenges. Now, Peter, I'm gonna, you know, sort of pivot for 30 seconds here, right? Now, we've, we've spoken and we wanted to be very consciously sort of specific. I hope that we were. Um, now I'm going to give you 30 seconds with Prime Minister Abe, right? So the door's open, you've got 30 seconds. And look, these guys are politicians. They've got an attention span of a mouse, right? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, you know, it's, it's, I mean, everybody could, sorry, no, sorry. Right. sorry. <laughs> of course, the, the local politicians accept it. <laughs> No, but look, I mean, you know, everybody complains, oh my God, Donald Trump is stupid because he can only understand a PowerPoint. Well, trust me, every politician is stupid. They only understand a PowerPoint. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it is the same, right? Even, and I can say this, Angela Merkel, trust me, PowerPoint, like one bullet point, and then she starts shaking. No, sorry. Uh, you didn't get the joke, good. <laughs> so Peter, sorry to bring it back. 30 seconds with the prime minister for, you know, your challenges and what you're doing about it. What's the one request concrete sort of legislative or rule request that you would have to make things better? <laughs> That's a great question. I think, um, for example, if you take an area like healthcare, yep. you know, because you, you can trust you get healthcare if you live in Japan, which is wonderful. However, it's a lot of cost, uh, and it could really use, I think, digitization. So there are ways that you could use diagnostic tools to really help better and more accurately know if someone had breast cancer or lung cancer or, you know, an issue with their kidneys, diabetic retinopathy, you know, ir irreversible blindness. So get these tools, uh, medical records being digitized. Um, you know, there's tools now that can really help remove documentation time for doctors. We have, you know, 10 times fewer specialists here than in the United States, for example, in radiology, but more scans with MRIs and uh, CT scans. So there's an immediate and, and an incredible opportunity, Prime Minister Abe, if you were to help from uh, the standpoint of regulation um, and just really sending the message out that, you know, there can be great reform in healthcare that could even lead to better patient outcomes, but done in a highly cost-efficient way if you use things like these uh, digital tools, machine learning, AI, etc. No, I mean, this, this is one of these amazing statistics about Japan, right? Like you mentioned, MRIs, right? Because an MRI here is cheap, right? The data Japan has the best data and the biggest data set in the world on MRIs. But the usage of this is the worst in the world, right? Because the data isn't connected, right? And so connecting those dots, I mean, I don't know what the savings is that you're gonna have, right? But in terms of the healthcare costs, right? That would certainly be a very, very worthwhile project, right? To actually engender. Now, You've got 30 seconds with the Prime Minister. Yes. You're going you're to you're charm him to death. Yes. <laughs> well, so mine is rather radical, I think. But I want a smart city, two or three. A uh, smart city. Smart city or SEZ, Special Economic Zone, uh, built in Japan where everybody speaks English, where foreign com companies are incentivized, tax incentive. So, you know, it's more... They, they, they want to come and they want to start businesses. And that's where it, it's a closed, open data sharing economy. So inside the city, maybe you can do this in one city in Okayama if it's possible. You open up the data for the medical records or the data you have at City Hall, who is living where. Well, I mean, you have to make sure that you address the privacy. But inside the closed community, you open up the data so that data scientists from the world can come and they, they can live and they can experiment with data and they, for example, you can do autonom autonomous driving experiment inside the city. You can do cashless technology inside the city. So, so I want to see more experiments getting done. Fantastic. I will very much support you. I think I'm a big fan of Abenomics. I think the one thing where they have slipped is this whole promise of Toku of special economic zones, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, over the last, when was the last time you heard the word special economic zone? I mean, you've got to have to listen to Governor Koike, right? Uh, rather than the top-down government, right? Ryuta, 
Yep. You've got now. You you have lots of time with the prime minister all the time. So you know, <laughs> not really. Well, <laughs> no. well, well uh, I, I would like to propose to introduce um, totally different uh, tax rate to um, companies in Tokyo and companies outside of Tokyo, so that um, the large corporations has has to scatter around um, Japan and to make well, like like state of Washington has. Uh, Amazon, um, Microsoft, and um, Boeing. Um, the Texas has Texas, Texas Instruments, Exxon, American Airlines, and even small Delaware has DuPont, uh, so that you can live in smaller city like um, Seattle. This is not small, but uh, San Diego, and and work for a you know, first tier company. Uh, I, I like to make each city is much more um, livable, uh, sophisticated, um, fun to live. Um, y you can make you know, tens of great cities, yeah, um, forcing these companies out. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's very, very interesting because, you know, as in the financial world, right, this idea of using tax incentives, right, to attract corporations, you know, so there's this trouble three hours from here in Hong Kong. Right, so we suggested and said, well, you know, if you just lower the tax by three percentage points for financial companies, right, a lot of companies would now re-establish their headquarters here in Japan, right? I mean, okay, it's like you don't want to jump on, sorry, the grave of Hong Kong, right? But you know, again, it's this point yeah, well, of using yeah, tax yeah. policy. Uh, actually, right now, uh, sizable, gr great amount of money is flowing into the other parts of Japan as a subsidy. And um, I think, yeah, to, economically, the Tokyo kept winning the monopoly game for the last 70 years. And um, the, the other part of Japan is using political power to regain the money back. Yeah, so um, I, I think that these uh, chiho should earn their living right. working for good company. Yeah, right. that's my so idea. Decentralization, yeah. tax independence, yeah. right? Rather than living on the gifts mm -hmm. given by the central government, right? right? Joanna, okay. 30 seconds with the prime minister. So I'm gonna go in with Tomoe-san. Who's your prime minister? Oh, sorry. Oh. Who's my prime minister? Mr. Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, sorry. maybe. I'm sorry. <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> perhaps. So I'm going to go in with Tomoe-san, if that's allowed. Yeah. We're going to be a double act. And I'm going to propose in the smart city, there should be a schooling system yeah. designed for innovation from kindergarten all the way through to graduate university beyond. Maybe Kolsan, you could be headmaster or overseeing headmaster. And the focus of that will be innovative teaching. So releasing the spark and energy of innovation that is in Japanese people, but is suppressed. And it just needs to be released. So if we can have an example of a, a system in this new smart city that we're going to build, I think that could give results, prove that there is potential in, in innovative thinking in Japan. And it just needs to be supported from the very early age. That's my suggestion. Fantastic. I'm on that for 30 seconds, when I'm asked over a glass of wine, what's the best investment opportunity in the world? Japanese rural real estate. I mean, they're giving it away. It's free. Now, why don't you, sorry, I pick on you, you're a successful entrepreneur, <laughs> you should buy some land in Tohoku or Okinawa, I don't care, and build a new city. Because you can do this, your holding cost of rural real estate is zero. They're giving land away in, Ki in Kyushu, right? So I think this sort of revitalization, and again, Rewanomics, it's not about what can Abe do. It's not about what can Suga-san do. It's not about what Meti can do. It's about what you can do as leaders and as entrepreneurs. And if your startup cost is zero, right? or your holding cost is zero, you can build these smart cities. Now, we've spoken far too much, right? Time for you guys, right? Any question? And if you could please just very briefly identify yourself and then keep your question to a question. Okay. <laughs> uh, Tetsu Terza from METI. I have a question to Peter uh, about AI. Um, it is very important to utilize AI, but we're sort of losing confidence in, in the competition for AI. 
uh, with a global perspective like you, how does Japan compare with other countries for the potential or the environment to utilize AI? What are the strengths that you may find in Japan and what are the weaknesses you may find? It's, it's a great question. I think part of the opportunity is to get more uh, trained up. So I think uh, that's why the government said, you know, over 250,000 people a year getting uh, training. So, because uh, right now, if you compare uh, with, say, even UK, there's more specialists in the UK. So that can change very quickly over the next five years, and it has to. Um, I think there's an openness, like I said, from the government, uh, from from just people, uh, to robotics, for example. I think there's more robots per capita, or there has been in the recent future, than anywhere else in the world. Um, and you know, if you think of elderly and how they can be supported, you know, using smart sensors and whatnot, it's uh, it's 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 very exciting. So I would say, mentality is great uh, for a potential leapfrog, and I think a lot of companies too with amazing background and experience in hardware manufacturing. Uh, you know, that's how Japan led the world. And in the past, you might have had 80% was hardware manufacturing, 20% software, and that slipped on its head. But machine learning, this computer science trend, is actually much larger than what we've experienced, in my opinion, over the last 20, 25 years. So if Japan really embraces this, it doesn't matter that there was a little bit of a lagging with some of this shift to software engineering because you know, we've had to train all of our engineers on machine learning. So it, it's a new type of approach and thinking where these you know, computers are, are getting smarter through learning. They train on data and then they make really smart inferences. So, so that's what really excites me because I think there's a great necessity with some of the, you know, the low birth rate and the aging demographics to really drive change. So it's interesting, right? So it's, so it's the openness, right? That there is actually a flexibility, right? That there is. Sir, Doug. Hi, um, Doug Mallinger from Live in New York, and I've been studying entrepreneurial ecosystems and countries for almost 40 years now. And um, one of the things I've seen is that entrepreneurial culture and entrepreneurial heroes in countries is really critical, and then the ecosystem uh, in it. If you go back to the early to late 80s in the United States, we didn't have an entrepreneurial culture. If you look at India, India took off you know, in the 90s. There was almost no IT there in the 80s. And so you know, as you look at, at uh, Japan, I'd love to understand, is that entrepreneurial culture from a hero standpoint who are the entrepreneurial heroes here that are being promoted and talked about? So it's quite interesting, right? The first ever self-made billionaire internet entrepreneur was a Japanese woman, right? Nambasan from Dena, right? Um, now, Japan is a culture, there's a lot of jealousy here, right? If you watch the Olympics in Japan, right, it's hilarious because he or she who wins a medal gets less airtime than he or she who comes in ninth, right, and cries, right, which is very important, right? So, you know, there's this, that, or the other, but I mean, certainly, let me ask you, right? You are a hero, right? Uh, <laughs> no, who are, who, are, who, are, who are, you know, why did you become an entrepreneur? And, you know, what, what does it feel like to be, in, to, to be in that ecosystem and to be one of the success stories? Yeah, to experience the uh, hard thing uh, in the uh, developing countries for me, it's the uh, motivation uh, to set up the uh, startup or company uh, personally. Mm -hmm. So uh, getting out of uh, your comfort zone and to visit the uh, developed countries uh, facing the uh, social issue, uh, that is a seed uh, and uh, driver uh, for becoming the uh, entrepreneur. No, I think, look, I'm very, very hopeful, right, that you now have this move towards intrapreneurship, right, within companies, right, where you're given 15, 20% of your time, develop a project, you know, once a quarter, once every six months, we have a judging competition. You know, if you succeed in the judging competition, we give you funding for a year. We shall see, it's just starting out, right? But I think the ecosystem is actually being built and hopefully all of you with your enterprises, you know, with your leadership, you know, are going to foster it further. Saito san. Hi. Yeah. Uh, 
Hiroshi Saito from uh, AECOM Japan. I would like to address to Peter. Um, if I were you, uh, and I, uh, if I were you, and ask uh, Prime Minister Abe, I would say that open the government because the biggest data holder is the government. And as long with you, your company, you know, open up all the data to the Japanese people, and I'm sure the entrepreneurship will be much more stimulated than ever. I, I was trying to articulate that with the example of the healthcare, but I completely understand. And I think with the Olympics coming up and a lot of opportunity uh, from media to transport to e-commerce, uh, it, it's incredible, I, I think, because you have such a sophisticated, advanced consumer here on mobile devices. And, and so I think the innovation that could come, the new products, the services, the apps, could be absolutely tremendous. And I think what's even more exciting too, along with that, it could be done in a way where it could be privacy safe. You could have the right rules to the road. So you could allow for that open innovation, but also know that uh, user privacy was being protected. And I think that could set a gold template for the world. Yeah, my name is Raj. I am a deputy head of mission in Indian Embassy. Uh, I was uh, like, Jasper always is an optimist. And I think that in the morning, the question, if it was put to you, you would have only asked the optimist part of it. So I'm very happy to be here. I just wanted to highlight a few things, what India is experiencing today. And that's where I think there is some synergy with Japan with regard to entrepreneurship and innovation. You know, innovation happens when you have problems. Japan doesn't have innovation probably because you have lesser prob problems. So what you need to create uh, probably, which is being done, is to create uh, challenges which brings out those problems to the universities for the student to solve in their third year of the engineering rather than getting out and getting working into shokushoshas of Japan. Because that is where the risk-taking ability of Japanese students is getting killed because of the past. Now the time has come where you have to introduce this challenge-taking capacity, support those risk-takers, which Prime Minister Abe is doing beautifully, but you need to do it more at that level so that companies are formed by the individual's two-member team, which is happening today in India. And I think what we are promoting between India and Japan is take out those kind of startups from India who have solutions for problems which are currently being faced in Japan, for example, healthcare, fintech, or logistics. All these areas, startups are having solutions. Today, Japan has to create those startups. Thank you. Tozo, I assume that was not a question, that was a comment. <laughs> um, thank you. Jackie Steele, um, a political scientist at the Graduate Law School at Nagoya University. And I've just started a consulting firm for diversity, inclusion, and women's empowerment, focusing here on corporate Japan, small, medium uh, enterprises, but also working in North America. I guess my question comment is bridging between both Peter's comments and also Governor Ibaragi. I feel like um, one of the biggest challenges that's not being fully invested in, if we're talking about where the investments go, would be in women's entrepreneurship in particular as not only a DNI strategy but also a womenomic strategy. And this is particularly important for the regions of Japan. If we're thinking about Shoshika Kore declining birth rights, birth rates, if women were shacho of their own companies, you take maternity leave when you want. You show up to work and you manage your face time as you wish, right? Um, so how do we solve with one go? How do we bring together opportunities for big major companies to be building HQ or rotating HQs across the regions of Japan to build up those hubs to also bring the, the Seishain jobs, but also to then support the ecosystem of women entrepreneurs across the regions of Japan? Um, actually, in my prefecture, um, women presidents, um, typically um, the daughter of a founder of a family business is um, doing a great job of making their own ecosystem. Um, and we know through their jobs that 
women as really passionate and capable, um, even though um, a lot of women uh, doesn't, uh, don't, don't show their ability in large corporations uh, right now. So um, th they're showing great examples, and uh, we have to kind of spread out uh, these examples. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to embarrass her a little bit. We have our marketing director here with us today, Mickey, who's vice president in Google Japan. So she's a great leader and role model for everyone, not just within Google, but I think that works outside of Google. And one program she put together is called Women Will. Over 1,100 companies have got on board with it, and it's getting women to come back to work. So uh, not just, uh, you know, to get back to the job, but also to have a, a similar career trajectory and tools, platforms that allow you to do, you know, flexible working hours. You go home and have, uh, you know, a dinner with your parents, uh, your kids, whatever. So that to me is going to be a key part of how we're working with startups and entrepreneurs as well. So the training that I mentioned, 10 million trained, it would be wonderful to have half of those be women. And I know Mickey is very focused on that with her team. It's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, as you know, I'm a huge supporter of womenomics. Uh, I don't have a choice. Um, <laughs> and 78% of all people working at the minimum wage are females. So the Sanka Hiditsa, the participation rate has increased. Yes, the environment has increased to the positive, you know, but still there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Any other question, please? Tozo? In the interest of time, we... we yeah. uh, my name is Katsuro Kido, uh, company from uh, uh, Yamaki. Uh, my company is uh, doing the job for creating uh, Japanese food. And I want to touch the gap between the super high quality of Japanese food and the super low quality, uh, super low efficiency of the fishery and the farmers. For example, the menu you see in the Singapore Health Restaurant just covers scalp from Hokkaido, everything coming from Japan. But down there, there is a sacrifice of the people uh, doing incredibly konjo, konjo, do konjo work. And uh, we have stubborn people, not only in the government, but also in the downs in the primary sector, uh, primary industry. I just want to introduce some IT technology to those people, but they are old, more than maybe 60 years older than that. So I'm facing some difficulty to uh, break that kind of mental block as the people in the uh, primary industry. I just want to hear some advice or uh, success story, or? You should connect with Peter um, after the session. Any other question? Do the point. Okay. Um, my name is Kotaro Yamaguchi. I'm a venture capitalist. And uh, I have a question for Joanna. Uh, I and Tanya-san here are serving as a board member of the only international boarding high school in Japan uh, named Itawashi Isaac Japan. So we are going to provide entrepreneurship course for high school students. So uh, what do you think, uh, what kind of pro programs were useful for your children to be an entrepreneur? Oh, thank you. I'm very pleased to hear that. I, I think the most impactful thing for my children and their friends has been to meet entrepreneurs. So get successful entrepreneurs out, bring them into your school, get them to talk to the children, show them how they did it, talk about where the ideas came from, the, the, the sort of the seeds of their enterprise. I think that's the best way to excite and release that energy and, and the ideas of young people. And competitions, prizes, get them to think of things, get them to invent. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you enjoyed the session, Ravenomics. Uh, I love the fact that we started out with cucumbers, <laughs> right? And then talked about all this muzukashi stuff, and then we end up at education, which is ultimately where it matters. And it's education for the young, as well as education for the old, right? Because we live in exciting times. There is lots of money to be made, right? But it's up to you to raise the challenge, and I hope Reiwanomics <laughs> provides you with that environment, because again, Japan is in a fantastic position, whether you like Abe or not, I don't care, these people are stable government. If you're in the UK, if you're in America, if you're in Germany, right now, fuante. It is not easy to decide where to build the next factory. 
In Japan, it's very easy to decide where to build the next factory. It is Okayama Prefecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>